Hello and um, welcome to this session of 5 by 15 tonight, where we're going to be talking about the wonderful subject of bread. Um, we've been joined by two fantastic speakers who I will introduce in due course, but thank you all very much for joining up and I hope that you've managed to enjoy some of the sunshine today. So bread, wheat, salt and water, that's basically all you need to make the world's oldest and arguably the most important foodstuff. Today, bread accounts for 95% of all the wheat that we grow on earth, providing food for a staggering two and a half billion people. It is, without doubt, the most successful plant in history. Its origins stretch back to the agricultural revolution and before, and it's found in ceremonies and religious practices across the globe. It is, above any other food, it's the story of who we are. It's um, something that's in probably every kitchen. I'm sure all of us have a loaf lurking somewhere. So to discuss this amazing subject, uh, we're very, very happy to be joined by Rob Penn and Colin Touch, who were both amazing speakers and thinkers. And Rob, who's going to start, has just published a fantastic book called Slow Rise, which is a sapiens-like story of how bread evolved and how tightly woven it is into the story of humanity. Rob spent a year determined to learn not just how to bake bread, but to learn about how to make a perfect loaf, which in fact he will tell us about, but also he tells us where this incredible grain come from, what has happened to it, where it's gone wrong, where it's gone right. He's a very prolific author himself. He's written books called The Man Who Made Things Out of Trees, The Wrong Side of Snow, and It's All About Your Bite. So you can see he's someone with many diverse interests. Our second speaker, who I'll talk a bit more about in due course, is the wonderful Colin Tudge, who I know many of you know. Colin is an author, a thinker, a visionary, and he spent so much of his life writing about the natural world. He's, he's also an expert on trees, but more the growing variety than the making. And he's um, a great agroecologist and expert on food and farming. So as always with our formats with two people, it's really simple. They are both going to talk for about seven or eight minutes, then they're going to talk to me, and then we're going to come over to you for your questions. Um, please put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen and start them rolling when you think of it. I hope we'll have a good length of time. There'll be details of their books uh, on, the, um, on the chat function, so please get that. They are both super worth reading. So with no further ado, I'm very happy to hand over to Rob Penn. Thank you very much, Rosie, and good evening, everybody. Um, welcome. I can't tell you how much I wish this was in a real space, in a real room uh, with real people, but here we are. Uh, so my book is about the story of bread, a story that began at least 14 millennia ago and which remains important today. The domestication of wheat triggered the beginning of the Neolithic revolution at the tip of the Fertile Crescent 11,000 years ago, and bread is still a fundamental component of our diet, as Rosie said, the staff of life, providing something like a fifth of all the calories consumed in a country like ours. 11 million loaves were baked in the UK alone this morning. Over time, the story of bread has been kneaded into economics, politics, human biology, and religion. The availability of bread has significantly influenced demography and population growth. And its story then, you could make a case, is the story of humanity. The need to maintain an adequate supply forged patterns of technological progress through the refinement of tools at first, and then via the use of power, particularly in the milling process, and finally in the development of large scale production. Similarly, it prompted key advances in agriculture and progress in the scientific discipline of plant hybridization. The need for bread also drove evolutions in global trade and the emergence of commodity markets. In this great epic story, bread went wrong. 
and it is difficult to put a finger on precisely when this happened. We made, as a species, a succession of wrong turns, often well-meaning, in agriculture, milling, and baking. And these wrong turns have proved to be very difficult to reverse, although I feel certain Colin will have views on that. The type of bread the majority of us eat today, made with white flour from wheat grown on depleted soils with chemical inputs, sliced, wrapped in plastic and made in a trice using processing aids, chemical leavening agents, and many other additives is a nutritional, culinary, social, and environmental mess. Over a decade ago, I concluded that this bread, modern bread, if you will, was making me ill and I stopped eating it. And then I discovered slow fermented bread, sourdough, made with wholemeal flour, basically old fashioned bread, the bread that our ancestors cherished. And this bread does not make me ill. To tell the story of bread, I decided, as Rosie said, to grow an acre of wheat myself, to sow it by hand, harvest it with a sickle, thresh and winnow it in my barn at home in the Black Mountains, mill it in a water wheel, uh, in a water mill in West Wales, all in order to bake bread at home for my family for a year. A conceit, perhaps, a contrivance, certainly a storytelling device, but one that I relished. As my American friend put it, I had no idea you were closet Amish. We live on a few acres, we grow our own fruit and vegetables, and we manage a woodland to provide biodiversity for nature and our firewood needs. Growing a plot of wheat felt like a logical part of our slow journey to become more attuned to the endowment of the earth. If there is a theme that runs through the books that I write about very different subjects, uh, the humble bicycle, man's relationship with the ash tree, and now bread, it would be that I try to illuminate the unremarkable and place value by the quotidian. And there is nothing more quotidian than bread. If modern bread is part of a food system that offers convenience, superabundance, uh, low cost, and consumer choice, well, I wanted the opposite. I wanted bread that was inconvenient, in limited supply, expensive, at least when you cost in my time, and without choice, but fundamentally with value. The act of baking bread at home is a celebration of a millennia old craft. It is also a small protest, a declaration of independence perhaps from corporations who seek complete control of a food system that has created a plethora of environmental problems alongside intractable human health issues. Baking bread at home is also about self-reliance. It's about wresting freedom from everyday necessity, something which a lot of people discovered for themselves during lockdown last year. For us as a family, it's about limiting our exposure to the bewildering forces of the global economy by bringing the provenance of things closer to home. Baking bread, is also, of course, about great tasting bread. Growing and processing my own wheat by hand was hard, and I realized that I am no farmer, Amish or otherwise. However, there is rudimentary satisfaction in having created something yourself. When the loaves come out of my oven, the world is, for a moment at least, breaking someone else's heart. Rob, thank you so much. That was fantastic. Um, I love the uh, descriptions of your 
baking efforts, and I think we may get back to them. Um, you clearly became a very good baker by the end of your year because you won a prize at a, a Welsh show. So that seems madly impressive to me. Um, on that note, let's hand over to our next speaker, the wonderful Colin Tudge, who is, as I said before, biologist, uh, educationalist, visionary. And at the moment, he's helping to set up the College for Real Farming and Food Culture. Um, Colin, uh, thank you very much for being with us and coming here to talk about your new book as well, The Great Rethink, which is uh, subtitled 21st Century Renaissance. Please welcome Colin Touch. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Rosie. And thank you, Robert. Um, my book is, is in, in, in one level, very, very pessimistic because it says, actually, if we go on as we are, and I'm not the only person to say this, then we're, we've absolutely had our chips. I mean, we'll be lucky if we go on as we are to get through the present century in a tolerable state. And in fact, it's pretty obvious that for many millions of people, if not billions, life is already intolerable. I mean, if you're hungry and you're being thrown out of your home because you can't live there for all sorts of reasons, and if your children are being bombed all around you, how could life get worse? So it's already terrible for many people. And of course, our fellow creatures are suffering enormously, and we are in the throes. We're not just looking at the beginnings of, we are in the throes of a mass extinction, the sixth in the history of, 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 of the world. And really all the big so-called charismatic creatures that we share this earth with are in imminent danger of extinction. So it's a dreadful, dreadful situation. On the other hand, although my book at that level is very, very pessimistic, it is also a book of hope. Because what I'm saying is that if only we did really rather conceptually simple things well, then we could still get ourselves out of trouble. And the most important conceptually simple thing, as indeed Rob alluded to really, is on the one hand agriculture, we need appropriate agriculture, what I'm calling enlightened agriculture, supported by or complemented by an appropriate food culture. And, excuse me, of course it is the case that although uh, both farming and um, cooking are conceptually simple. I mean, it's easy enough to say. They are both, of course, technically rather difficult and you have to be very skilled and very, very patient to do them well. But a, a lot of people can do it and a lot of people are very, very skilled indeed. The second great difficulty, actually, is that um, in order, you can't put anything right ad hoc. You can't put farming and food to rights unless you also address everything else. And that's really the point of my book and that's why I call it the great rethink. And for example, you have to start off by saying, what are we really trying to achieve in life? What's our goal? And I find it quite remarkable that uh, most governments don't properly define what it is they're actually trying to achieve. And that probably is a very big reason why the world is in such a mess. They don't actually know what they're trying to do. At least they sort of say things like we must have economic growth and we must, what's that great slogan, um, put America first and all that kind of stuff and take back control. Meaningless slogans. They're not really trying to define what we're trying to do. And in my book, I suggest what we should be trying to achieve. It's not up to me to say should, but other people seem to agree, is to create um, convivial societies that we all enjoy living in with personal fulfillment within flourishing biospheres or within a flourishing biosphere. In other words, other creatures must be doing well as well. We cannot just look after ourselves without looking after everything else. That's the goal. The second thing is though, that to achieve this, we have to put everything else right as well. We have to put the economy right. We have to put the governance right. We have to define what our moral principles are. We have to define, well, we have to work out what kind of science we really need, what science can do and what it can't do. And none of these things are properly addressed. Rob alluded to it when he said he wants to produce food that is not necessarily just cheap, but is, is, is value. In other words, is, is in fact quite expensive. 
Uh, but the policies of, of governments, successive governments to the last half century in Britain has been to make food as cheap as possible because they say very piously and very self-righteously, um, if we don't make food as cheap as possible, then the poor people won't be able to afford it at all. Well, already in this country, of course, millions, literally millions of people can't afford fresh food as it is. And the real point is not that the food is too dear, but that there is such incredible um, economic inequality in the country. So that some people are literally a thousand times richer than the poorer. And you can't possibly have a convivial society or a fair or just society if some people are a thousand times richer than others. And yet very few governments in recent memory have focused on, in fact, I can't remember any, have focused seriously on the idea that we need a more egalitarian uh, um, e economy. And the present lot, of course, with their neoliberalism are certainly not going to do that. But let's get to the point. We've got to do everything right. Let's just focus on this particular thing of food and farming, of farming and food. And the kind of farming we need is what I've been calling enlightened agriculture, which is also known as real farming, which is why we have the, the College for Real Farming and the Oxford Real Farming Conference and the Real Farming Trust and so on and so on and so on. But I like the idea of enlightened agriculture. And enlightened agriculture is defined as agriculture that is specifically designed to provide everyone everywhere with food of the highest quality, highest quality both nutritionally and gastronomically forever. And by forever, I mean, let's start with the next million years and then, then go on from there. Not just try to survive through this century, but think about the very, very long term. And the point is that if we farmed properly, according to the principles of enlightened agriculture, then this is eminently possible. It's easily, it should be technically easy to produce enough food for everybody that's ever likely to be born without wrecking the rest of the world, without cruelty, without injustice. And yet at the moment we fail miserably to feed everybody well. And of course there's enormous cruelty, enormous injustice, and we are wrecking the rest of the world in the process. And the methods of uh, enlightened agriculture, there's really two very big ideas, which I certainly didn't think of, but I've borrowed them. One is agroecology, where you treat every farm as an ecosystem. And the other is what's called food sovereignty, where everybody has control of their own food supply. Put those two things together and we can easily food enough provide enough food for absolutely everybody. And at the moment, in fact, the world already produces enough macronutrient, enough protein and calories to feed 14 billion people. And the United Nations tells us that the population should not rise above about 10 or 11 billion, which is a lot, but we're already comfortably able to sustain that level if we go down the enlightened agricultural route. Now, the enlightened agricultural route in detail means that we need to focus, first of all, on plants. It doesn't mean that we need to be vegan and eat plants exclusively, but it does mean that we need to focus on plants because they are the main source of protein and calories. And as has been said, the main, the most important plants that we grow are in fact the cereals. Also the pulses, also things like the potatoes, the tubers, but it's the cereals that really carry the day. And of the cereals that we grow, the three main ones are wheat, rice and maize. And of those, wheat is the main one. So the first thing we've got to get right is growing of wheat, which is arable farming. And Arab, if you do that, if you focus on arable farming, first of all, and then on horticulture, which grows all the other plants, fancy things that make it flavoursome and, and, and provide the vitamins and so on, you're more or less home and dry. And then you should be growing livestock or raising livestock only in, as it were, the, the interstices in, in the margin. So you, you raise sheep and cattle in places where you can't really grow crops very well, high on the mountains, semi-arid desert um, wetlands, and you keep uh, the omnivorous livestock, pigs and poultry, on basically on leftovers and surpluses. Now, if you do that, you finish up with a lot of meat, 
Uh, sorry, sorry. A lot of plant food, a lot of cereals, pulses, and other vegetables. Great. You don't produce much meat, but you do produce some, and what you do produce is a very high quality. And you should also make use of whatever grows locally, berries, nuts, etc., etc. And you grow lots of different kinds of livestock and lots of different kinds of crops, mixed farming, so you get maximum variety. So the enlightened agriculture will produce plenty of plants, not much meat and maximum variety. And now we get into the tremendous serendipity, which I think is rather wonderful, that if you look at the nutritional advice of the last 60 years, it looks incredibly complicated. And there are whole libraries full of books about nutrition. But actually, if you boil it down, the best nutritionists of the last 60 years have been saying you should eat plenty of plants, not much meat and maximum variety. So there's a great serendipity. The yep. kind of farming we need and the kind of nutrition we need are exactly in tune. But there's a better, there's a final serendipity, which is that if you look at the world's greatest cuisines on an axis, I would say from Italy to China with everything in between Persia and Turkey and everywhere else of that kind, um, the very best and out to China, then you find uh, that that's exactly the sort of structure of the traditional cuisines. Plenty of plants, not much meat, a maximum variety. I like to say that in Turkey, it's not true, but I like to say it, um, basically you eat lots of, lots of cereal, wheat and rice, and uh, plants and local plants, nuts, berries, the whole lot, fruit. And you eat, if, if a goat happens to die, then you have some meat and otherwise not, and you do a bit of fishing. That's the way to do it. <laughs> Anyway, um, thank you, Colin. I that's you have my time, Rosie. I, probably yes, but I've got so many things that I want to ask you that um, I'm going to move on to some chat between us. But that was fantastic. I mean, I would add to what you said that in fact, if we eat more plants, much less meat, that obviously is what we need for the climate as well. So, in every single sense, um, variety and all of that, this kind of diet is what we need. So. Rob, coming coming back to you. I mean, when we when wheat was first grown, was it? Uh, and you talk about how it sort of had a great life in the Fertile Crescent and, and in Egypt. They obviously had amazing soils at that point, didn't they? Rob, certainly in Egypt. Um, I mean, I think yes, I think soil fertility along both of the rivers in the Fertile Crescent. The Tigris and the Euphrates was extremely good, um, you know, certainly for the, you know, the, the rise of the Mesopotamian civilizations along the Nile Delta, you know, Herodotus called it the gift, the flooding of the, the Nile Delta every year brought an extraordinary richness to the soil. And, you know, it, it remains in, incredibly good wheat growing country even th to this day. Um, and I've actually visited Egypt. I went to Sharkia province, uh, you know, about 120 kilometers north of Cairo, which is the great wheat growing province of Egypt since the Pharaonic times. And, you know, all historians from the time of Greek civilization right up until the survey of Egypt that was conducted on uh, on instruction by Napoleon in 1798, they all recorded these incredible yields uh, mm. of, of wheat in, in Egypt. Can I just yes, make well, a point of that, Rosie? Yes. That Colin, yeah. What Rob said is obviously true, and that's in and Egypt's a wonderful centre, but the soil of most traditional agricultures is nothing like as rich or fertile as the stuff that you get now when you bang on tons and tons and tons or kilograms and kilograms of artificial nitrogen and so on. The, the traditional soils often had a very, very good structure, but in general, they were fairly low in nitrogen. And of course, wild soils in general, though they can be very lush, also are low in nitrogen. And the more you throw on nitrogen, the more you get these incredible yields, but also the more you get pollution, the more you get both air pollution and water pollution and so on. And the other, th the other thing is, the other thing is, um, the other idea, oh, 
what you now get then, you pile all these all this fertilizer on, especially to arable crops, because they're the ones you need to produce in huge quantities like wheat. And what you get then is massive surpluses, actually. And the, the real reason for the modern uh, intensive livestock industry, which relies on arable, is that you've got these massive surpluses that you've got to mop up. So mm -hmm. it's all driven by money and the damage is enormous. It's, it's absolutely mad. We want to get the fertility up in the way that Rob's described, but only by what one might call natural means, not by this... Uh, Yes, of course. Yes. No, no, I, I, I think we'd all absolutely agree with that. But Rob, back to you. I mean, for it, wheat was grown traditionally in the same way for a very long time. And, and really, there was a huge change, wasn't there, when people started making machines. And you talk about the kind of the, what happened when we got a combine harvester and the threshing machines that suddenly that changed the whole face of agriculture, didn't it? Yes, I think it certainly did. It, it basically, the mechanization of farming made agriculture in the Midwest of the USA viable uh, and then on the Great Plains. So from the 1860s onwards, uh, you know, the European, um, Europeans moved on to the Great Plains and converted what must have been, you know, one of the most important ecological mm -hmm parts of certainly, you know, temperate regions of the earth then left into one enormous farm. Uh, and they dug up the sod, you know, they all got their quarter section uh, and they dug up the sod and mechanization made that viable. The first you know, tool, you know, machine that they had that really brought that down was a threshing machine. And it's, you know, it's interesting to consider threshing. So threshing is the, the part of the process of producing flour from wheat that entails separating the grain from the spikelet or the uh, it contained in the wheat ear. And at, at one point pre-machines, it, it is thought that it took up something like a quarter of all agricultural manpower in Europe. So that's sort of to, up towards the end of the 18th century, which is just extraordinary. That's amazing. So when you suddenly put the, you know, you get to the combine, you're actually being able to harvest hundreds and thousands of acres with very, very little labor, isn't it? Exactly, exactly. Uh, and, you know, the first threshing machines were seen as a threat by agricultural laborers. In the UK, there was, you know, an outbreak of riots in the 1840s mm -hmm. called the Swing Riots. Same thing took place in various continental countries. Uh, you know, because it was it was recognised then that the machine posed an enormous threat to the means by which landless agricultural labour labourers earned their winter coin. But it, as I say, the, you know, the so the the threshing machine over a period of you know uh, 60, 80 years turned into a combine. So that's the first ones were horse drawn, and then they became mm -hmm. organized towards the end of the nineteenth century. And that meant that, you know, harvesting wheat on a massive scale on the Great Plains became a viable industry for the first time. And, and let's just um, talk through um, <coughs> Colin's view on this. I mean, because you, you write a lot about, of course, when we got this white flour and how white flour became... Uh, you know, a bit like, I mean, the what people wanting to eat meat to show that they were well off. I, I was really intrigued by how whiteness became the thing that rich people wanted and was seen to be better. I mean, it's had a terrible legacy, that, hasn't it? Yeah, I, I think it's quite interesting or very interesting that one of the things, one of the real drivers of what people actually eat is nothing much to do with physiology nothing much even to do with tradition, but has to do with fashion and prestige and perception and so on and so on. So we've seen this in our own lifetime, how fashions have changed from decade to decade. And there's a, again, there's a kind of um, sort of feedback loop going on here because white flour is, mm. is probably in a sense, the most difficult to produce because you've got to mill away about 30% of the grain to get to it. And so there's all that input. Also, though, I think Rob will agree, it's sort of very easy to bake with because it's very, it behaves itself well and you can get an easy um, a loaf that will rise very well with using white flour. 
And of course, then you not only industrialize the production of the wheat with combines and all the rest, but also the bread making process itself. And you bypass the sort of sourdough processes that Rob describes in his book. And you do it all by adding massive quantities of wheat and other additives and so on. And the great sort of so-called breakthrough of the 20th century was the so-called Chorley wood process, where you cut out the long fermentation, which takes hours and hours and hours, not your time, but you know, it's taking time. And you do the whole thing in 40 minutes and produce these, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the whole thing, the commerce, the cheapness, the eat convenience, etc., plus the prestige of having something white, um, all work together. And the Chorley wood process became the dominant process of how we get bread in the world, isn't it, really? And yeah. what I, Rob, what I was always, someone said to me that the whole thing about the Chorley wood process, because it uh, makes the yeast ferment very fast, the yeast doesn't really ferment properly and ends up fermenting in your stomach. Is that, is that true or is that a sort of... There, not there, is, there, is, there seems to be some scientific evidence to suggest that. I mean, I think that... Um, so, the, you know, the interesting thing about the Chorley Wood pro bread process, just to take a step back, is it, it was another well-meaning idea that just happened to have appalling consequences. So the concept was that we in Britain produce a bread-making process that allowed bakers to bake with the low-protein flour, low-protein flour that we commonly grow in this country. So it would provide an incentive to use British flour over and above Canadian imports at that time in the 1960s. And the consequences have been disastrous. And it happened to be very quickly a process that large bakers, as well as the medium-sized mm -hmm. village bakers or town bakers that existed then, the network of them that still existed in the, across Britain in the 1960s, many of them disappeared overnight because the, the industrial bakers got hold of the process. It suited them immaculately and it's now gone global. But yes, so I gave up eating bread because, modern bread, over a decade ago, because it made me ill. And, you know, and, and I went through, you know, lots of tests to try and work out what was making me ill. And I had a test for celiac, it wasn't celiac. I read a lot about bread. I read people like Andrew Whitley came to understand that modern bread is the mess that it is. So I stopped eating it and I got ill, uh, sorry, got better very quickly. And, and in analyzing what had gone wrong, I came to understand that it was the length of fermentation time that that was the critical point in well when you when you think of it like that it becomes incredibly obvious that it would then do really weird things to your inside and to your intestine the other irony it seems that you you point out in your book is that in the process of making bread like this all the nutrients were extracted from the original wheat and so bread makers then put it back and now you get this sense of these fortified breads where you're putting back actually what you should have got in the first place <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the white bread industrial complex. I mean, it, it, it's incredibly difficult to break down, but you know, the industry is unmoved by, by complainants like me and Colin and others. But yes, so the most nutritious part of the grain of wheat is not the endosperm, which produces white flour, it's the bran and the germ. And they contain, contain lots of micronutrients, which uh, complement a healthy human diet, and obviously the bran, you know, is incredibly good for, for, for all sorts of things in our stomach. So yes, the best part is taken out, fed to livestock or sold to pharmaceutical companies who convert it into vitamins, which they sell us in different shops uh, because white bread's not making us very well. Can, can uh, I add no, yeah, please, yes, come back because I wanted to ask you something. So yeah, do add on to that. I, I just want to say, I mean, to add to the irony, if you, one of the things that they, gets knocked out are what are called the micronutrients, the sort of vitamins and some of the minerals and so on and so on. If you look up the, the sort of um, National Health Service, NHS recommendations on diet, they will tell you how much you know, of each of these things you need. But all of them say, if you have a balanced uh, diet, a very varied diet, then you shouldn't need any kind of additives. But mm -hmm. 
largely because of what Rob's saying, they take the stuff out. That's why you actually need the, the fortified stuff. And then they make a great virtue of this and say, isn't it wonderful we're putting all these things in, which would have been there anyway. And the other thing is that until you take out the brand, the fiber, one of the great advances of nutritional theory in the last 40 years has been the realization that fiber really does matter, that the actual fiber in the food. And it's not just sort of a way of scouring guts, you know, with a Brillo pad. It's a very <laughs> active player. And one of the reasons it is, is that it's a, a substrate for all the micro, 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 microbes, microbiota that live in the gut, which are, again, essential players in many ways. And that, again, is one of the great sort of paradigm shifts, the importance of, of, of these mic microbes. And so that modern nutrition is largely about, it's largely an exercise in ecology rather than an exercise in chemistry. And it's the fiber that sort of drives that. And that's again, to do with the, 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 the nature of the bread. Okay. And, well, can I just add there, Rosie? So, you know, so one of the things that dramatically went wrong was the milling process. So when we went from milling grain on uh, stone water wheels, to steel roller milling, which became widespread probably from the sort of 80, early 1880s. That meant creating white flour was incredibly straightforward for the first time. And that made it available. It was an extraordinary democratization of taste that took place you know, for urban populations at that time. And very quickly, people realized that something was wrong. You know, there were outbreaks, you know, at a societal level of berry, berry and pellagra, both vitamin deficiency illnesses, which, really? which you know, the, the industry was asked to reconstitute bread in order to get rid of these. And, you know, the first, the earliest wholemeal bread movement in America, you know, their, their adage was the whiter your bread, the sooner you're dead. So, so it's not exactly, you know, new science that wholemeal bread is better for you. You know, we, we knew a while back. Well, yes, that's really interesting. But I think that, I mean, I grew up and I suspect, Colin, you're the same. And I, I mean, Rob, you say you are. You know, we all had that Hovis advert that was made by Ridley Scott. And they play, is it Vivaldi's Rites of Spring? Well, that little boy comes down a hill on his bicycle in a town that's sort of West Country town. And you're sold this, the fact that Hovis was brown. And of course, it was meaningless, wasn't it? The fact that it was brown at that point. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> so, Colin, can I come to you because I'm going to come into some questions from the audience but there's a question here from Jerome Bourne which is actually also what was going to be my question to you because he's asked what strain of wheat was Rob using on his acre and I just wanted you to tell us a little bit and keep it because I've got we've got hundreds of questions coming in what the, the, there are three great strains of wheat and we've sort of lost Icorn and Emner is that right? Uh, okay, so I, gr I grew two varieties. One was Emma, which was, as a wild variety, one of the two um, varieties of wheat that were first domesticated by, by humans at the tip of the Fertile Crescent at the beginning of the Neolithic Revolution, and the other one was Einkorn. So wild I Emma still grows there. You know, I went to look at it, but, but this is domesticated Emma which was the wheat variety that fueled, you know, the, the, the power of the pharaonic um, empires under, uh, you know, in ancient Egypt. And it was uh, incredibly important to the Romans. And then it began to disappear because of something called bread wheat. I won't go on about that now, but it became a relic crop, but it is still grown in various parts of the world as a, as a primary wheat crop. And then the other one was a variety of Welsh, land race wheat called uh, Hein Gemro, and, and that, that was the land race wheat that was grown in West Wales and was you know, adapted to the microclimate of West Wales, and it was grown into the 1930s, and it was one of the last land race wheats to be grown uh, in Britain. Fantastic. Colin, yes. Um, so can I, I'm going to come to some other questions for you here. You, you are saying, uh, I've got Neil Johnson here saying you're very interested in your comments about livestock in the margins. Regenerative agriculture would suggest a return to mixed farming with organic inputs to soil being a necessary part of soil health and restoration. Is that, is that how, is that a correct assessment? Yeah, certainly it is. Yes. Yeah. Um, 
And on that note, um, Gary Jones, who says, good to see you again, Colin, by the way, land ownership and control is a massive factor in this. Do we need legislation? I'm very interested in the answer to that too. Do we need what, sorry? A bit... Legislation. I mean, it is, it oh. is very difficult for people to start farming. I yeah. mean, to get so, even five yeah. um One of the very big issues across the world really, but very acute in Britain, is the whole issue of land reform, who owns it, what's it used for, and so on and so on. And it needs rethinking from first principles, there's no question about that. And it, it, it's very simple to say that big landowners are bad and small landowners are good. It's not quite as simple as that because some big landowners that I know are in fact in the proper sense philanthropists, I mean they genuinely do like humanity, and some that I know are actually trying to break up their land and use it in, in smallish units to get many, many more people back onto the land. So they're probably doing as well with their area that they might have inherited as anybody could do. So why, you know, if it ain't bust, don't fix it is my uh, approach to it. But many, many people who own vast areas of land are using it for nothing except either parking their helicopter or else um, trying to make as much money as possible by industrial farming, contracting it out, etc. So my only point, I, there isn't time to discuss it really, is that massive land reform across the board is vital. Um, yeah, yeah, go on. Yeah, no, okay. Um, the, uh, Katie says, following that up, it strikes me that a lack of political will and corruption are the biggest barriers to ecologically sound farming. And um, I mean, I'm very pleased that we've come out of the common agricultural policy and the way that that subsidized land, but it is very difficult issue, isn't it, about how you do subsidies for farming? Because without a doubt, our food is too cheap. And without a doubt, people in this country and many countries can't can't afford to buy healthy food at the moment. Yeah, it is the case that you'd agree with me, wouldn't you, that, 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 that probably the most fundamental thrust here is a much more egalitarian um, economy. So, I mean, you cannot have these hugely rich and, and abjectly poor. The other thing is um, that well, it's a point that's very crucial to what Rob was saying about the techno te technology coming into farming. Technology can, if it's appropriate, as Schumacher said, make everybody's life easier and make it, you know, mean that we can fit in with the wild environment much better than we do at the moment. But if it's simply directed to make rich people richer and make lots and lots of money, then it can be enormously destructive. And one of the great virtues, as far as the sort of powers that be are concerned, is to minimize labor in all industries, but particularly in agriculture. And agriculture is considered to be more efficient, in inverted, in inverted commas, the fewer people you have. And that's a tautology because in fact, efficiency is defined largely in terms of how much produce you get per worker so if you have fewer workers and you don't diminish the output too much, then by definition, it's more efficient. But it's only efficient in financial terms and it's only efficient in financial terms because oil has been cheap. Mm. Once the conditions change, then it, you see how absurd that is. But the kind of efficiency we should be looking for is what I would be calling biological efficiency or ecological efficiency. How much good food can you get out of an area of land with minimum inputs, mostly chemical inputs? Now to do that in general, farming has to be very skilled and very, very, very complex and very skilled, not, not simplified. And if you have, in other words, mixed farming, and if it seems to me that in a country like ours, where we have something like 1% of people working full time on the land, we've only got about a tenth of the number of people on the land that we really need to make it work well. And one of my little minor campaigns is, well, is that we should, in this country, we've got to increase the number of farmers and growers by about tenfold. Now that's not on anybody's agenda. It's not on the Labour Party's agenda or the Tory Party's agenda, but that's actually what's got to happen. 
Yes, well, I can see, I, I completely agree with that. And I, but I think it's, a, as you say, it's very far from the agenda. And Rob, you, you tell, um, I, I want to come before the end to, to get you to tell some stories about baking your own bread. But just before that, and following up from Colin's point about the efficiency, you have an incredibly interesting story in your book about you know, when you're with those guys in the Midwest that, uh, that go around doing extraordinary amounts of harvest on a for freelance basis. Can you just briefly tell them, tell us about them? And then I want to talk to you about your bread making. Um, so, uh, yeah, I went and spent some time with a chap called Jim Dybert, who is uh, chairman of the USA Custom Harvesting Association. And custom harvesting is... Um, you know, harvesting for other farmers. And of course, you know, for since, ever since the beginning of agriculture, harvest time is an incredibly difficult time with respect to manpower. So, you know, a farmer can pretty much choose when he sows and when he threshes and when he mills and when he bakes, but harvest, um, you have to get perfect and you have to harvest at exactly the right moment. So this chap, he was um, from the Great Plains and he travels down with his team in a convoy that is three kilometers long and includes six combines, which are worth uh, half a million dollars each in value, huge John Deere combines uh, and mobile homes for a crew of two dozen men who've come from all over the world to make this journey. And they start in Texas in May, and they drive north, ostensibly up this amazing road called US Route 83 that runs from Canada to, to, to Mexico. And they drive up that road harvesting for different farmers. And they harvest, you know, 40, 50,000, 60,000 hectares of wheat every year and make a three and a half thousand kilometer journey to do that. And it's quite extraordinary. I mean, they were wonderful people. They were sort of like, you know, industrial agro gypsies in a way and they were charming and, and delightful with great stories but they are part of an industrial system which is completely broken and the weird thing is you know when you're with them on these great plains you know as I met them in South Dakota which is pretty much where they end up at the end of the harvesting season and you get out of your car on US at Route 83 and there is nothing you know, mm. there are no birds, there are no insects. You turn the soil over, there is nothing in the soil, nothing moving, no, no tiny critters and no worms or anything. And it's quite extraordinary. And every single inch of the land is farmed, everything. Yes, it's, it's like being in a giant factory, isn't it? I, I find I now look at some of those those fields when there's no birds or no no certainly no animals in the margin. Um, we've got a lot of questions uh, which are about what is gluten, and one here saying, um, is there something about the variety of wheat that we grow now that means there's more gluten, or did people always have gluten intolerance? What is gluten exactly? Um, uh, sh sh shall I go first, Colin? I, I don't mind. Um, so wheat, wheat contains two proteins called glutenin and gliadin, and they combine in the fermentation process to create gluten. And the we know, we can say with some confidence that something like 1% of the population of Western democratic countries today is celiac. So that is a serious autoimmune disease which, which, which arises from consumption of gluten. And celiac disease has been around certainly for a couple of thousand years. You know, doctors understood what it was and wrote about it a long time ago. The incidence of celiac disease is on the rise. And that seems to be out of proportion to um, other factors that might cause a rise in celiac disease. But something called gluten intolerance, non-specific gluten intolerance, is rising incredibly dramatically. And is that related to wheat varieties? I, I would say, you know, the, the evidence to suggest that it is, is, is mounting all the time. Do you agree with that, Colin? Yes. Um, one, one thing I, I've been is that there has been a lack of research in this. I mean, yeah. gluten is actually quite complicated. I think there's a whole variety of different 
kinds of gluten within different varieties of wheat. The difference between them has not been well examined. Whether it's total quantity or whether it's the nature of the gluten is not known. And it's again an, another example of something that one feels must be looked at, must be researched, but isn't because it's actually in nobody's financial interest to look at it. So we don't really know. I mean, what Rub says must be right, but you know, what are the details? Nobody knows. Well, I think that's that's true of so much food. I mean, it, it, if you think of uh, all the, uh, the the sort of junk food we get in shops, I mean, these would not pass. Um, the targets set by food and drug drug administrations for a lot of the rubbish that we very happily put into our bodies in vast quantities. So, um, Colin, do you bake? Uh, I have done, but not not well, and I, I don't as a rule. No, I have made chapatis. I rather like chapatis. Rob's got stuff in his book about um, unleavened bread. I think we should make much more of unleavened bread than we do. I mean, some of them are really very, very nice indeed. Um, There's a lot of trouble. Essentially, salt, water, and flour, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. I quite, I like the idea. I mean, this is sort of elementary cooking stuff that you get water and flour, you add fat, you get pastry. You add water and flour, you add egg, and you get batter, and you add egg and 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 fat and water, and you get uh, cake, and you um, add. We you, we you add some kind of fermenting agent or not, and you get bread or whatever. It's 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 there's a whole three dimensional spectrum of things that you get by mucking about with wheat in different ways. This All is explored. chemistry that we we just take for granted every day, don't we? That we stick it all in a bowl and shove it in the. Yes, so, yes. How's your baking efforts gone? I, they seem to have been a bit up and down. Is that, um, I mean, I know they ended up on a big up, but uh, well, well, tell me yeah, about well, so as, that. As, as Colin said, so I learned to bake sourdough bread with white flour, refined white flour, a long time ago. And as Colin said earlier, it's remarkably easy. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a, you know, it's a, effectively an industrial product in it. Um, and it has a huge amount of tolerance within the baking process. Baking with wholemeal flour, stone ground wholemeal flour, which is active, you know, it changes in nature day by day after it's been milled, and it only stabilizes after several weeks, is a completely different prospect. And it's much more complicated, much more nuanced, and you have to be much more reactive as a baker, uh, and actually, I, I would argue, a better baker. And to begin with, Rose, you're absolutely right. I baked a lot of pancakes or Stone Age Frisbees, as my kids called them. You know, it's what very you, difficult making it right. What was, what was happening? What were you doing that wasn't quite working out? So the, the, when grain is ground on stone, the bran, the outer coating of the grain itself, is sheared as the wheel turn, the two wheels turn. And that creates tiny flecks of bran, which are incredibly sharp edged like flint. And when you put those into uh, dough to, 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 you know, for, to in, initiate the fermentation process, as the chains of gluten or amino acids form, which create the network in dough, which allows it, it to capture the carbon dioxide as it's created during the ethanol fermentation, forcing the dough to rise, creating risen bread, the flint edge brands shear the chains of amino acids all the time. So the, the additional procedure, which was, was given to me by, by an incredibly knowledgeable wheat chaser, baker and activist called Andy Forbes, is, is a process called auto lees. Very simple, you soak the, the, the flour, the wholemeal flour, in the water for an hour or two before you start the fermentation process by adding the, the leavening agent and the salt. And that just softens the bran edges and it allows wholemeal bread to rise. So how long was it before you got uh, like a really good loaf that you felt? Uh, there were a lot of uh, Stone Age Frisbees, Rosie. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, took, it, it, took a, it took a fair few weeks and a lot of dud loaves. My children had to eat the lot and they, they became very impatient. And the fact that through lockdown, lots and lots of people have turned to baking, what, what do you think that says about 
about us and about what we kind of yearn to do? I'm sure we are. I mean, we are, we, one has to ask about what is really the purpose of life. And one of the things that, that human beings really do is, is make things. I mean, that's, I talked at the beginning about the need for convivial societies with personal fulfillment. I do think the word fulfillment is much better than the word happiness, which is often equated just with hedonism. You know, the American, uh, what's it called, Declaration of Independence, uh, uh, was it life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Well, that's not quite, not quite right. It's fulfillment that counts. And as I say, we get fulfillment by doing things and doing them well and developing craftsmanship. One of the terrible things that's been happening in society really for hundreds of years is that progress is equated with the replacement of craft, which requires skill and effort and money, with simplicity, with machinery. Mm. Well, what's happening now is that technologies are so big and are so um, clever, smart technologies, that we ourselves are becoming redundant as human beings. And it's absurd that we should call it progress when we make ourselves redundant. And the problem that we've never really come to grips with, although there's a few very good writers like Schumacher and Illich and Ruskin and so on, is how we develop technologies that on the one hand genuinely do make life easier and on the other don't simply wipe us off the map. And we've never solved that and we don't address it properly. I think that's a really good point. And again, you've seen it in lockdown by the fact that people want to cook or want to learn some kind of craft and want to do things with their hands rather than just click buttons. And what, what have you done, Colin, in lockdown or, or at any time? What do you do with your hands? That... Well, I'm, I'm very lazy. I think that's <laughs> key to my character. And what I actually enjoy doing is writing. So I sit here and type away. And these okay. days I, I sleep a lot. Is that, is that a good enough answer? But I used That's to garden. Right. used to like gardening, but I can't do it anymore because of my knees. Okay, all right, you're off the hook. Rob, apart from um, baking, and I obviously you, you grow and you farm, and in fact, someone's asked a question about how long it took for you to size your field. How long did it take? Uh, two days. Um, uh, and you know, I'm not very good at it. Um, and, and I did have help from my neighbours and my wife um, uh, and my children, actually, weirdly. Um, so, so, yeah, about two days in total to do the entire thing. Do you do any other things with your hands? Well, I make, I make walking sticks, actually, and that is something that I, I, I love doing and, and I um, have neglected for one reason or another. And so I, I made a lot of walking sticks during lockdown, which was... What, what wood do you use? Uh, I like to use blackthorn. Um, I've been using ash just to try and um, celebrate the ash, but mainly blackthorn. And what are the tops of your walking sticks like? Are they nice and knobbly? Uh, so uh, well, I make, I, sometimes I take the root and turn it into a handle uh, of the tree. And sometimes if it's a decent sized root ball, I will shape it off. And so you get, get the white, uh, the, you know, the white, the white knob on the end as in the great Irish knob Kerry. Very good. Well, I think maybe you should make one for Colin and we could commission it. <laughs> I'd be delighted to. Thank you. Yes. Need one. <laughs> so I now come up to time. So I'd like to thank you both very much and say to everybody out there that these are two fantastic books, Colin Tudge's The Great Reset and Rob Penn's Slow Rise. And you will find out so much about the world, humanity and what we can do and think together in the future. Thank you so much to all of you who joined in. There's lots of you out there. It was really nice to know, even though we're only connected by the virtual world. And I'm sorry for everybody whose questions we didn't get to, but I did we did try to kind of scoop them up into general things. Um, again, thank you so much for joining us. I'm very sorry we're not all in the same room that we could all had a bread together. But please get baking. Um, I mean, get baking bread. Um, we haven't actually even discussed uh, baking shows on television. We'll have to leave that to another day. So thank you all very much. Join us again soon. Tomorrow night we have an event about biodiversity. 
um, which Professor Das Gupta is talking at, who recently wrote the Das Gupta Review. So if you can stand us again, please join in and enjoy your evening. And thank you very much indeed. <laughs>